Metroid Prime 3 came out, you'd have needed a lot of initiative and a little luck to even get your hands on the console it came out for. Nintendo's Wii, which had been out for almost a year, was still setting the world on fire, despite an exceptionally odd input device that looked more like a remote control than something you'd want to use for video games. But this was Nintendo's strategy from the outset. They let their competitors fight it out in their traditional console wars, while they set sail into the vast blue ocean of the uncontested market. The Wii was sending trimmers through the industry by becoming not only successful, but successful because it was widely sought after by a demographic that had never self-identified as gamers. And who knows, hopefully some proportion of those millions of people who'd never played a game before would seek out something a little more elaborate, and realize that games could be more than just bowling simulators. But Metroid Prime 3 wasn't supposed to be for them. This was for us. This was Nintendo's chance to prove that while there was nothing wrong with motion-controlled tennis, the Wii would still have plenty of room for the kind of substantial, complex, meaningful experiences that we knew this medium could offer. And few series had a more positive reputation for all of that than Metroid. Hopes were high. While Echoes was overlooked on a console that was a bit of a lame duck by 2004, its sequel would be released on the hottest console the industry had seen in some time. And Nintendo did its part by putting a ton of marketing muscle behind it. The company launched a campaign called The Month of Metroid. A free preview channel on the Wii screened new trailers every single week. There was this building, palpable hype and anticipation for Metroid Prime 3 that just wasn't there with Echoes. But while I remember that, it's not really what comes to mind first when I think about this game's pre-release period. No, what left by far the biggest impression on me was this. On August 20th, 2007, Nintendo released Super Metroid on the Virtual Console. For a pittance of 800 Wii points, I got to play it for the first time. And if you've been following the advice at the start of these episodes, you know how that went. One week later, August 27th, and what a day that was. I could not wait to play the new Metroid game, and it was all thanks to an old one. I finally understood why I had never heard a bad thing about this series. The depth of the gameplay that becomes more and more brilliant as the player uncovers more abilities. The isolation of a lone bounty hunter against a cohesive, believable world enriched by subtle storytelling. The mature blend of ambience, aesthetic, and yet optimism that set the whole series apart. I brought this brand new Metroid home from Blockbuster, I booted it up, and... I was greeted by a game that featured a seemingly endless cavalcade of immersion-breaking motion control puzzles framed by a heavy-handed narrative driven by unskippable cutscenes featuring creepily uncanny characters droning out a plot that I had no context to understand or care about. I didn't even make it out of the prologue. This was Metroid's biggest and best chance to convert me into a fan, and the game completely blew it. But that was ten years ago. It took a little longer, but in the course of making this very series, I would come to self-identify as a Metroid fan. And you know what? I was wrong about Metroid Prime 3. Let's get critiquing. An unknown vessel's status report gets a bad case of the B-Sods. The anomaly is coming from a storage room full of Phazon pods, and who should appear but... Dark Stamus survived? Then Stamus Aaron opens her eyes. This opening is very to the point. The game doesn't start with some kind of last time on Metroid Prime. No, it doesn't make it remotely clear what's even happening here. And you know what? That's okay. When I was first playing this, Super Metroid's intro had just recently thrown a lot of backstory at me, and without the context of the previous games, it was pretty baffling. But because I have now played Prime 1 and 2 and thus have context, it raises a lot of questions. How did Dark Samus survive? Where even is this? Prime 3 will eventually answer those questions, but we don't have any time for that. It's time for the motion control tutorial. Samus's power suit has always had this extended cannon coming out of her right arm. Say what you will about the Wii Remote, but there was one thing it was very, very good at acting as a pointing device. Because of that, Samus's arm cannon now has perfect one-to-one -one movement with the player's right hand. And I gotta come clean with you guys. In doing this series, I wanted the full spectrum of the Prime experience. To that end, I'm still happy I played the previous game with the GameCube pad. But honestly, I really should have just played Prime 1 with a Wii remote. I had good intentions! I was trying to give myself the best possible shot at enjoying the game by playing with mouse and keyboard. And it works surprisingly great for the most part, but you remember how much I complained about weapon and visor switching being clunky? That's because there's such a big difference between holding down a key and pushing your whole arm forward in order to move a cursor that's not meant to be controlled with a mouse, versus just holding down a button and flicking your wrist up. Metroid Prime 3 
and by extension the other games in the Prime Trilogy, utilize the Wii Remote to achieve, bar none, the best FPS control scheme I've ever used on a console. It's natural, precise, immersive, and tuned to absolute perfection. And it better be, Retro Studio spent an entire year of development just to get this right. But the original Wii Remote was only really capable of precision like this when used as a pointing device. To work around this, motion controls that don't involve the pointer are held in clearly defined sequences that require wide, clear movements to open doors or start up generators. However well implemented they are though, they don't really add much to the experience. They don't detract from it either, mind you, but it's telling that from the tutorial to the very last door, these on-screen prompts that make it explicit exactly what you're supposed to be doing with the Wii Remote can never go away. Samus eventually stops flailing around and gets her gunship pointed at the Olympus, a Galactic Federation ship. But the tutorial is just getting started. Please calibrate your weapon by shooting these targets. Whoa. To this point in the series, the only spoken dialogue was Super Metroid's iconic intro, and I guess the power suit system reports. The original Prime held to similar standards as the 2D games in this regard, but Prime 2 introduced a few friendly NPCs, and now Prime 3 is chock full of characters with full voice acting. Samus heads up to the ship's briefing room and is suddenly beside herself. No, wait, that's just a new character named... Gandreda? She can shapeshift, I guess? There's also a robot dude named Gore and a big bruiser of a guy named Vegeta. I mean Rundus. And look, Uncanny 2007 Human is here too. The human's name is Admiral Dane, and he activates Aurora Unit 242, an organic supercomputer. Together, they explain that the Galactic Federation's other organic supercomputers have been infected with an unknown virus from the Space Pirates. But not to worry, they've made a vaccine. A ship called the Valhalla went missing side After of the, the Space Valhalla Pirates Valhalla. attacked it and stole its AU, then used that to hack the network. Now Samus and whoever these guys are are gonna travel around and upload the vaccine to all the AUs before the Space Pirates take advantage and mount an attack. And before you can even process that's what AU stands for, the Space Pirates Attack! Remember what I said about Super Metroid's intro being a little too intricate for players new to the series? Corruption's prologue is exponentially worse. It's also strange that for all the babbling going on around her, Samus is still a silent protagonist. Like, dialogue boxes are one thing, but characters actually speaking their lines make these concessions stand out a lot more. But hey, the voice acting itself is fine, and I don't mind a silent protagonist, it's just the degree of stuff they're trying to fit into this scene made it impossible to follow. And where Super Metroid's intro was this amazing recap for people who were already familiar with the series, Prime 3 doesn't even have that excuse. Playing the previous two games in this trilogy does nothing to provide context for who these people are or what's even happening here. Literally, my only note was that the Federation's Aurora units reminded me a little bit of Mother Brain. And that is a cool detail. Look, the plot holds together and makes sense to me now, and this scene becomes a lot more endearing, but only because I had the whole game to understand what was happening. Without any context, it was just a convoluted exposition dump of an unskippable cutscene. And you know what? The whole prologue is kind of tedious. There's a boring gray spaceship full of uncanny NPCs. There's a holographic AI companion. And it all serves as a linear tutorial that's pretending to be difficult with flashy explosions. Come on, Retro, I'm sorry Echoes got overshadowed by Halo 2, but I don't think that meant anyone wanted Metroid to just be Halo. I may be overstating how I feel here, but by continuing past this point, I've already made it further than I did in 2007. The highlight here is one of Corruption's most substantial upgrades, the Grapple Lasso. It complements the control scheme extremely well. Your right hand is Samus's beam cannon, and now you thrust your left hand to whip the lasso. And while it feels a little gimmicky at first, it turns out to have all kinds of utility. You can use it to open doors, remove debris, rip enemy shields away, and eventually even to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. It's the quintessential Metroid upgrade, full of creative potential in both combat and puzzle solving. This planet, called Norian... Norian? Norian. Oh yeah, voice acting. Norian isn't a place that you get to explore. Rather, it's the site of a Federation outpost. The game tells you exactly where to go, and arranges explosive set pieces and enemies for you to overcome before you get there. It's not very Metroid-y, but a linear action game is exactly the part of Prime 1 that I really liked, and there were admittedly some awesome moments here. I love how something just whooshes overhead without pulling you out of gameplay, letting you experience firsthand the moment that Ridley shows up. I love this ridiculously over-the-top boss fight, as Samus and her greatest enemy 
Tony plummet down an energy shaft, taking shots at each other the whole way. I don't know how I feel about how Samus escapes that situation. At this point, I felt like the game was trying way too hard to make me go, Wow, he skates around on ice and look, a cool battle robot and ooh, shapeshifting girl is so aloof! Like, the game wanted me to think these characters were cool and powerful and worth caring about, but they're just kinda generic. The most important part of conveying what a game is comes in the first 30 minutes. I was well over an hour in by this point, and based on that, Metroid Prime 3 seemed for all the world to be a linear action game featuring a team of hunters going on a series of missions. And like, it's just weird, isn't it, to see Samus Aran working alongside and getting saved by other characters. It's weird that it's been this long, and the game still hasn't remotely felt like Metroid. But finally, Dark Samus shows up and flips the freaking switch. She effortlessly decimates the whole team with a single blast, and then just flies away. Ooh, mysterious. Samus is barely able to maintain consciousness long enough to bring Norian's defenses online. Then she slips into a month-long coma. When she wakes up, Samus learns that her doppelganger's phazon beam corrupted her and the rest of the crew. Their bodies now naturally produce phazon energy, and without even asking, the Federation has fit them all with phazon enhancement devices. From a visual sense, Samus has a new look. The PED suit is designed to enhance Samus's abilities using her body's natural phazon. It's a fusion <laughs> of Galactic Federation and Chozo Tech, and while I didn't really care for the clashing, busy design at first, it really grew on me. More specifically, it grew on me as the corruption grew within Samus, and the suit got darker in turn, taking on these neon blue highlights. It's a little extravagant, but it's neat. The other three hunters woke up weeks ago and were dispatched on other missions, but the Federation has lost contact with all of them. So from a story sense, Samus is finally on her own. And what do you know, there's a mystery to solve. From a gameplay standpoint, it's where it makes the biggest difference of all. At any time, you can hold down the plus button to channel an energy tank and enter hyper mode. Samus's beam cannon becomes this rapid fire blaster that vaporizes enemies. The missiles, morph ball, and even the grapple lasso also get upgraded throughout the game to do new things in hyper mode. The Federation thinks that the PED suits have no consequences, but as is so often the case, the Federation is very wrong. Staying hyper for too long causes Samus' body to start overloading with Phazon energy. The meter starts automatically rising, and taking damage just shoots it up even higher. If it maxes out, Samus' mind is corrupted, and she loses herself to Dark Samus' influence. There's a lot to love here. You can tell how much Retro wanted this to stand out, how visually distinct the Switch is. Hyper mode feels insanely powerful, but that's a double-edged sword. The problem comes in how the game has changed around it, and how these changes have affected the difficulty curve. Beam upgrades stack for the first time in the Prime series, and that's cool, but they've also lost their distinction. The plasma beam melts stuff, but it feels just like the Nova Beam that shoots through things. There also aren't any super combos, and missiles are much weaker. As a result, outside of hyper mode, enemies are insanely spongy, requiring a ton of just mashing the fire button to take down. This is all to incentivize you to use hyper mode, but if you do, it's the opposite problem. Your foes get blasted apart so quickly, you don't even really need to come up with a strategy. Tying it in with your health was probably an attempt to balance this, but if you're fast enough, you can just exit hyper mode before corruption sets in, and maintain the health that you didn't use. I see a lot of potential in maintaining it under fire, letting yourself take hits to stay powered up longer, and I imagine that's exactly what you have to do on higher difficulties, but I feel like I'm not really overcoming anything, and the game is just letting me make progress by putting time into it. This really should have just been called Easy Mode, but I'm playing on Normal, and where Echo's Normal difficulty was satisfying for a first playthrough, Corruptions is just monotonous. Normal is what most players will play on their first time, and the presence of Hyper Mode forces you to choose between combat that's tedious or combat that's unsatisfying. Samus takes orders from, well, yes, a big blue head in a tube. Actually, this is the Olympus's onboard Aurora unit. I said earlier that Samus would be alone, but that's not quite the case. The Federation's AU network will be there to guide her through the rest of the game. And when I say guide, I mean guide. When I arrived on the closest Phazon infested planet, I knew my mission. I had to find out what happened to Christopher Sabat and investigate the meteor that impacted the planet. And I would need to adventure through uncharted territory to do it. Finally, it's a Metroid game! Samus, the Leviathan Sea is protected by an energy shield. 
Or, yes, I guess an on-screen prompt could just tell me exactly where to go. Honestly, in a game like this, I'll take all the help I can get. But if you're a Metroid fan more for the discovery, this may be a deal-breaker. On the other hand, Metroid Fusion did the same thing, and it's largely done the same way. You might know where to go, but you won't necessarily know how to get there. In this case, it told me to go to a downed Federation ship, but that was the easy part. To actually get over there, I had to seek out a side path and find the grapple beam. But here's the difference. Fusion might have been a linear take on a Metroid game, but because of that. Because Fusion always knew exactly where you'd go and what path you would have to take, it could be a far more punishing experience, with a much sharper difficulty curve. In other words, it was able to evoke the strengths of a more traditional action game. Corruption, in contrast, holds your hand for the same reason Hyper Mode has no significant consequences. For the same reason the default difficulty is so much easier than it was in Echoes. Nintendo was hoping that Prime 3 might appeal to people who'd only just started to play video games, so it's all done in the name of accessibility. Prime 3 is more directly linear than either of its prequels, but some of the changes it makes in that effort turn out to be half measures, as if the game is trying to maintain the illusion of non-linearity. Why else would you have shortcuts that only work from one side? Why else would the game rather pointlessly let me get ahead of where I need to be. In Fusion, you could occasionally do this to see something Samus wasn't supposed to know about yet, something that broke the fourth wall. In Prime 3, you just hit a brick wall. And look, I appreciate a lot of the quality of life changes, like being able to hop the Morph Ball with a flick of the Wii Remote. Corruption also no longer wastes your time by artificially cutting you off from save points. Now when you die, you'll just restart from a checkpoint. Point is, there's nothing wrong with making a game more accessible, and it could have been a lot worse. It's not like the AU pops up and reminds you, Samus, running into fire will hurt. But even if you disable the hint system, the game will still prompt you where to go. The only difference is that it doesn't leave markers on the map. Like I said, I'm bad enough at navigation that I kind of need the hint, so it doesn't affect me, but it is a ridiculous choice that there's no way to disable these on-screen prompts. You've got to give the player a choice. To that end, here's an example of accessibility done right. At about the midpoint of the game, I found an observatory that launches satellites and collects data on other planets. Launching these satellites will literally show you exactly where every single upgrade is located, and even denotes which ones you found from those you haven't. For many people, I'm sure, this is counter to what they enjoy about Metroid. For me, it's a tremendous incentive to actually bother with upgrades. What's fun for me is not finding where they are on a map, it's figuring out how to get them. And Prime 3 does have some fantastically intricate upgrade puzzles. But in spite of how I feel about it, how is something so disruptive to the Metroid formula an example of accessibility done right? Because it's totally optional. You have to power up the observatory, you have to send out the satellites, and you have every opportunity to ignore it and find everything yourself if that's what you want to do. And seriously, it was 2007. It would have been simple to just hop on GameFAQs and find everything anyway. Putting it in the game as a convenience cuts out the middleman. So Hyper Mode disrupted the combat. The Observatory disrupted the adventure. The third piece of what makes Corruption such a disruptive take on the Metroid formula is in the cohesiveness of its world. Or to be more exact, the fact that it doesn't focus on a single cohesive world. Past games were largely set on a single map. A single planet, brimming with environments that wove in and out of each other. Prime 3, on the other hand, takes place across four planets, and rather than weaving between ecosystems, Samus is free to fly between them as the adventure progresses. Brio is the most traditionally Metroid-y planet, featuring an unfamiliar race that blasted itself back to the Stone Age after a civil war. Despite the remnants of civilization, it's the most naturalistic world, with Samus using the flora and fauna to her advantage. But it also features the greatest environmental variety, spanning across cavernous fuel gel mines to a snowy area that was so out of left field my jaw dropped when I got here. Brio is also where I found out that Samus can pull herself up on ledges in this game. Let's see, let's look in the menu... Nope, the power grip isn't here. Well, I guess that cinches it. The Prime games really aren't part of the canon. Wait, these ledges are supposed to be magnetic. Mmm, you win this time, Retro. Seriously, there's a reason the game finally clicked with me when I got here. The other three planets all allow Retro to expand on the franchise's more familiar elements. I've already mentioned Norian. Despite my misgivings about the prologue, it's still neat to learn more about the Galactic Federation that's been hiring Samus for all these missions. The next planet is one of those- Cut that out! Stop playing that song! I mean, I love it, but it's too much of a good thing! This awesome little rift has been used throughout the series when Samus first appears on screen, both at the beginning of the game and when you first load a save file. It's consistent to the point that you get sort of conditioned. You hear this, and you know, here we go, it's Metroid time. But the reason it works this way is because it starts each session. 
Prime 3 misunderstands its meaning and plays it every single time Samus steps off her ship. It's no longer the kickoff of the adventure, it's just marking the end of a loading screen, and it loses a lot of charm in its repetition. That loading screen, by the way, lasts way longer than any of the earlier game's elevator scenes ever did. In those earlier games, you would occasionally have to wait a second or two for a room to load, but it was barely a hiccup. In Corruption, even when I'm taking my time, I found myself staring at a door. Staring at a door. Ah, finally! Chalk up another win for minidiscs. This is only exacerbated by the way that you move between areas. Samus's gunship has been an iconic part of the series since the second game, and on the one hand, it's great to see it with so much more functionality this time around. It even gets its own upgrades. But like a lot of things in Prime 3, in taking so many steps forward, Retro makes a few stumbles. The process for moving between worlds lacks polish, as you always have to get in the ship, select this button, and choose your landing site. You cannot navigate from the identical map in your interface, and you can't back out once you hit one of those icons. Cutscenes can't be skipped until you've seen them once, and even when it's done loading, these flybys of the ship count as cutscenes. So if you need to fly somewhere new, and you have to summon your gunship, this process takes nearly two minutes, and you're just setting there. The first-person perspective of the ship doesn't even have any useful functionality outside of the tutorial. There's all kinds of gizmos and buttons to hit here, like triggering a red alert and raising defenses. Given that the game kept forcing me to be here, I figured it would eventually pay off with Samus actually fighting from the ship. But it never happens! It's cool for the sake of immersion that you get to set here, but the game could have streamlined things by letting you just pick a destination from this menu. With all that out of the way, hopefully I can finally talk about the planet Elysia. Is the song gone? Elysia is a lost Chozo outpost, though it's not an ancient ruin. It's just recently been lost. The Chozo built a self-aware robotic race to maintain Skytown, an absolutely gorgeous floating city. Yeah, Bioshock Infinite, eat your heart out! I found the screw attack here, coming much earlier than it did in Echoes, and so it gets a lot more chance to shine. If the Wii was often derided as being two GameCubes duct taped together, then Corruption is a testament to just how powerful duct tape can be. Skytown has a scale and a scope that the GameCube couldn't have pulled off, and the graphical fidelity on display throughout the game shows a level of detail and polish that still holds up today, especially when you run Dauphin in high definition. There's a sequence in Skytown where you build a nuke and drop it on the seed shield, and it all runs in real time! Samus barely makes it out on an escape pod and... Oh, come on! The final planet, or at least the final planet that's not alive, is the Space Pirate Homeworld. After two decades of battling these guys, Samus finally gets to take the fight to their front door, and it's cool to finally see how they operate. The Pirate Homeworld is a jumbled, chaotic mess of hallways, steeped in a torrential downpour of acid rain. I found these doors that I didn't have any way to open, and then I found the X-ray visor. Ah, uh, see, the Space Pirates are the galactic equivalent of people who keep their passwords on sticky notes attached to their monitors. Splitting the game into different planets comes with pros and cons, but I think Retro does a good job accentuating the positives. Every planet has its own themes, gimmicks, and backstory. That said, none of them are as cohesive or as complete as what's come before, but that's an acceptable trade-off given this game's greater narrative scope. This is a story that needs to be told across multiple planets. Why? Because each of these planets has been impacted by the same sort of meteor that narrowly avoided hitting Norian. The same sort of Phazon-based meteor that caused catastrophe on Aether and Talon IV. Hmm. Samsa's goal is to make her way into the seat of the meteor the same way she did in Prime 1's climax and rip the phase on out of the planet. And what stands in her way? Well, remember those other hunters dispatched by the Federation? The whole point of showing us how powerful these guys were in the prologue, the whole reason the game had to establish them as being Samus's peers, of being people that she cared about, was because they all become corrupted by Dark Samus. They're not generic buddies you spend the game fighting alongside, they're corrupted comrades you spend it fighting against, and if our hero and doesn't get to the bottom of this soon, the same thing's going to happen to her. This gives the adventure a personal pathos, and given how little I cared about them before, it was surprising how much it tugged at my heartstrings to see them like this. Again, Rundus got the worst of it. After a brutal dynamic fight, he appears for a second to regain his composure, only for Dark Samus to force him to commit suicide. That's the most ruthless death I've ever seen in a T-rated game. Corruption is thematically way less grounded than what's come before. It's a little more sci-fi and a lot more vibrant, 
it, but nothing is more surreal than these scenes, where Samus has to take down a monstrous abomination of Phazon. But as much as I was loving the scale of these bosses, only the first one was really a fight. After that, I had enough energy that I could just tank hits and blast them with hyper mode, and again it got a bit dull. Each time Samus takes down a seed, she absorbs the corruption, and so it spreads within her. The first time this happens, she pukes out liquid Phazon, the same as Metroid Prime itself did. To see Samus Aran show vulnerability like this, to see how badly it's getting to her, is both unsettling and effective. You see her face in the scan visor now, and while at first I thought that was just a cool detail, late in the game her eyes are changing color, and her blood vessels are coursing with corruption. At first I was worried that it would be overt and heavy-handed, but then the story backed off and became more personal. And because these elements stay out of the game for so long, by the time Admiral Dane and the GF soldiers meet up with Samus and storm the Space Pirate homeworld together, it's a climactic moment that the game set up and earned. But in contrast, here's something indicative of Prime 3's strange balance of strengths and weaknesses. About halfway through the game, an AU tells Samus that they've discovered the remains of this Federation battleship that was ransacked by the Space Pirates. When I got that message, I headed there immediately, and discovered that I would need to use these big, battery-like energy cells to progress further. Scanning gave hints for where I might find more, and I assumed this was where I needed to be to progress, so I spent a rather long time trying to find more batteries, only to run into more brick walls. Why? Because this is not the next part of the adventure, this is Prime 3's game-ending fetch quest. Retro, to their credit, took the criticism that the previous two games received to heart. The menu makes it clear which batteries you still need to find, and most of them are easy enough to come by naturally. I had quite a few even the first time I came here. To find the ones that were more hidden, I was going back to planets I hadn't been on in ages and pushing into brand new, completely unexplored territory. Where Prime 2's world weirdly stayed the same regardless of how much light you brought back to Aether, Samus's actions are actually having an effect on Prime 3's planets, with GF soldiers making repairs on Norian or standing guard at the pirate homeworld. To get these batteries, I had to have a rematch with a few mini-bosses, but because Samus has so much more powerful weapons now, the techniques to defeat them are completely different and really satisfying. To put it mildly, I was surprised at how much I was enjoying myself. If you're gonna do a game-ending fetch quest, this is how to do it right. It was with a lot of confidence and excitement that I set out for that final energy cell. But what I didn't know is that in order to pick it up, I would have to do one of the most tedious things I've ever done in a video game. Thanks to the fact that I had already wasted a bunch of time earlier in the game, I knew I'd eventually need to pick up this big power cell with the gunship tractor beam. I did so, then I got to rotate one half of a bridge into place to connect these two areas. So far so good, right? But in order to actually get on the ship and go to the area where I needed that cargo, I had to drop the cargo. So I went to the other side and I found this giant golem I didn't know what to do with. Turns out I needed to push into yet another area and use my ship to pick up a giant golem head, then drop it down to open up this place. Now I could finally rotate the other half of the bridge into place and connect the two sides of the map. But wait, with that giant power cell back where it started, I could no longer get out of this underground tunnel. So I had to trek all the way back to my ship, go back where I started, get back to the power cell, tractor beam it up, cross the bridge, head to the generator I needed to power, and finally drop the power cell in so I could get the final battery. The other cells were actually fun and interesting to get, but in the time it took me to pick up this last one, I could have beaten Metroid Zero Mission. I said as much on Twitter, went to bed, and the next day I woke up to this. <sighs> there are a total of nine cells. I only needed five, but the Valhalla has so many extra places to put cells that lead to incidental upgrades, you can't pick them up once they're placed, and so there's no way to know where to go without experimenting. And don't get me wrong, this is still way better than the previous game's fetch quests, but it could have been perfect with just a little more conveyance. Even after all that unnecessary effort, I was still pretty hyped to see this payoff. On the other side of a wormhole, I discovered a planet called Phase. It's a sentient world where these enormous meteors called Leviathans are harvested within what are literally called wombs. When they reach maturity, they're sent out to impact with other planets. This is the source of all Phazon, the source of all the cataclysm that's afflicted the worlds in the Prime Trilogy. As the corruption spreads, the local life forms are used as hosts to protect the seed, and eventually, the doomed planet becomes a clone of Phaze. It's unexpected, imaginative, surreal, and 
really uncomfortable. As soon as Samus steps foot on Phase, her corruption surges. By venting her energy tanks, she's able to temporarily stave off its effects. There's no way to return to the ship from here, not because the game has created an artificial barrier, but because the gunship no longer recognizes her as Samus. That's how close she is to losing herself here. She's trapped in hyper mode. Samus has gotten a super-powered weapon in the finale before, but typical of the Prime series, this is an innovative, threatening take on a familiar concept. Samus makes her way into an inner chamber, tears the biological walls off of a Phazon womb, and performs an abortion on the infant Leviathan inside. I told you this was going to be uncomfortable. Only then does Dark Samus finally make an appearance. The fight here is way better designed and more dynamic than any of Dark Samus's battles in Echoes, owing partly to how much more varied her attacks are, but mostly to the same advantage that Corruption has enjoyed throughout. Pure and simple, superior FPS aiming controls. Eventually, Dark Samus merges with the corrupted AU that was stolen from the wrecked ship, and so the Metroid Prime trilogy ends the same way the first game in this series did two decades before. Samus Aran beats up a giant brain. I love this. Dark Samus, the personification of Metroid Prime, finally kicks the bucket, and Planet Phase dies with her. With that, every bit of Phazon in Samus' body dries up, curing her corruption. The planet is on the brink. It's time for an epic escape scene! No, no it's not. We just cut to Admiral freaking Dane listening to a casualty report. He seems unfazed by how much of the fleet's been lost. He just wants to know if Samus is okay. Seriously, is he supposed to be her dad or something? But of course, Samus has gotten herself out. She gives a triumphant thumbs up directly toward the player and transmits two simple words. Mission complete. But you know what? I kind of glossed over that last section. And I guess it's because it just didn't leave much of an impression on me. This final boss fight. This was what it was all building toward. And I've got to be honest. It was kind of anticlimactic. Like, sure, if that meter filled up, I'd lose, but since I was always in hyper mode, and since it rose so slowly, there wasn't any real tension. It was flashy and impressive, but it was style over substance. That meant the ending, in turn, lacked any real triumph. It felt unearned. Yet, keep in mind this is a game full of climactic moments. There were plenty of times throughout this adventure when Metroid Prime 3 surprised me, when it all came together, where it just clicked, but there were just as many times that the game seemed to stumble on its own ambitions, seemed like it didn't have a handle on what kind of Metroid game it wanted to be, and failed to play to the strengths of what it was doing. There are a lot of trade-offs to this one, and of all the games I've covered on this channel, I don't think that one has ever made me feel such a juxtaposition of thrilling highs and frustrating lows. But if the game really did frustrate me to this degree, why was it that as the credits rolled, all I could think about was how much I wanted to play it again? The first Metroid Prime was the core of a game I'd have loved, marred by flaws that irrevocably ruined the experience for me. Knowing where to go wouldn't have fixed all the convoluted progression, and playing on a higher difficulty would have only made the combat more spammy. Metroid Prime 3, on the other hand, is a game that I often loved, marred by flaws that I now know how to overcome. I didn't even hesitate. I started a new game. This time I'd be able to skip all those cutscenes at the start, and I'd be able to skip every single repetitive scene where the ship takes off and lands and takes off and lands. The version on the Wii U eShop drastically improves the loading times, and the Dolphin emulator can be set to load even faster. With these two changes alone, the game wouldn't so constantly start and stop, it wouldn't lose flow between areas, and I could just play the game. This time, I won't have to go on that convoluted quest for a single energy cell. I can, if I choose to, only pick up the cells I need. I'll know how to avoid all those progressional brick walls. And most critically, I'm playing on the hardest difficulty, which has a very appropriate name. I can finally find out just how essential hyper mode can be. Now look, just because a player can learn to avoid pitfalls doesn't excuse them. But I'll put it like this. Super Metroid is my favorite game in this series to play through once, but Zero Mission has proven to be my favorite game to replay. In a similar manner, while I adored going through Prime 2, it's gonna be a while before I'm inclined to pick it up again. Whereas with Corruption, it's been a bit of a struggle to stay away from it long enough to complete this episode. When I get here again, when I see that thumbs up again, it will be triumphant because I'll have earned it. After everything I've experienced in this series, it's a bit of a shame that the first Prime tends to be the only one culturally considered a masterpiece. Because this is not the Metroid Prime collection, and this is not the Metroid Metroid Prime Compilation. This is the Metroid Prime Trilogy. These three games, 
released across two generations over a five-year period, may well be the pinnacle of a premeditated, cohesive series of video games. Each game individually sets itself apart, builds on its own themes, and excels at unique aspects of game design and storytelling, yet each game also enriches the experience of the other two. These five years were the golden age of the Metroid franchise, when the series achieved an unprecedented level of importance and consistency, and the core of all that was this Prime Trilogy. All these years later, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to finally experience them. That being said, playing them all and critiquing them all over the course of a few months hasn't been easy, and that's why this season took so long to produce. I don't usually play these sort of games that focus more on a lengthy campaign than a replayable one, and I'm admittedly a little burnt out, but I'm sure that how I feel doesn't remotely compare to how Retro's development team must have felt. From the time Prime was conceived, they had done nothing but work on Metroid for seven years. There's a reason Corruption has so much finality to it. They knew this would be the end, and so it was. Prime 2 came out on a console that was dead in the water. Prime 3 was released on the hottest console in the world, with a ton of promotion behind it, and yet it barely managed to outsell its predecessor. It seems that the first game in the trilogy, perhaps because it was so ahead of its time, was the only one to really capture a mainstream audience. But by 2007, the very elements that made it such a groundbreaking title had become the standards of AAA gaming, and Metroid had returned to cult status. Given that, and given that Retro was moving on, maybe it was time to go in a different direction. Maybe it was time to make a 3D Metroid game that reintegrated some of the efficacy of the 2D series. Or maybe decisions would be made that would stall the franchise for nearly a decade. As for Nintendo, they would spend the next few years diving deep into the blue ocean. But when Nintendo was finally ready to stir the hearts of the hardcore, they would once again call on Retro Studios to revive a fallen franchise. Please don't feel obligated to, but if you're in a position to support this channel on Patreon, then for just a dollar, you can see the Geek Critique for Donkey Kong Country Returns right now, a week early. For three bucks, you can binge the entire completed season, and my milestone bonus this time will be for a game that nearly killed a franchise, Metroid Other M. Thanks for watching, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing.